back to the IEA channel. I'm Emily Carver. I'm the media manager at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Today I'm joined by Professor Len Shackleton, who is Editorial Research Fellow at the IEA, and Matt Kilcoyne, who is Deputy Director of the Adam Smith Institute. Some economists have argued that keeping the furlough scheme open until 2021 would be good value for money. According to the National Institute for Economic and Social Research, it would only cost £10 billion but would save millions of jobs and help growth. On the continent, Germany has agreed to extend a scheme that tops up pay for workers and France is set to extend its temporary unemployment scheme to avert bankruptcies and layoffs. So Matt, should I start with you? So the furlough scheme has helped protect millions of jobs and has been a lifeline for millions of people, I think it's fair to say. Is there not a case to extend the scheme until people are back to business as usual? So to understand whether it's worth extending the furlough, you have to understand why the furlough existed in the first place. And that was to try and retain a level of productive capacity in what was um, effectively seen as an uninsurable um, and emergency event. So like, just like a natural disaster, like a flood or a fire, um, you're non-discriminatively helping people, um, whether they're rich or poor, um, because you're trying to ensure that as many people are saved. So what the government was trying to do was actually make means that people had the ability to stay at home, that they weren't having to go into offices, that they weren't looking for work, that they weren't in having human interactions, uh, because we were trying to ensure that human interactions were as low as possible, to ensure that as many lives could be saved as possible. Um, on top of that, they then were like, do we allow firms to fail because... They don't have any workers in them, no, no custom at the moment. Um, and do you want those firms to still be there at the end of it? Or do you want the allocative efficiency of the market system? And so they said, actually, this thing will pass, that the, that the disaster will end, and therefore that you should be paying um, some form of sort of corporate social welfare um, in order to ensure that some capacity is retained in the, in the wider economy. Now, as we've moved back from a position where we didn't know anything about the virus, we didn't know whether it was highly virulent, very dangerous, a very high mortality rate, we couldn't trust Chinese numbers or Iranian numbers. Um, we couldn't even, we didn't even know really whether uh, the outbreak in Italy um, was indicative of a really, really bad outbreak here in the UK. We still, you know, we're still tentative about what the winter's gonna be like in Europe. Um, but we're a bit more confident that this disease is more manageable um, and that it doesn't lead to sort of like 10 to 20 percent death rates. It's, you know, looking towards the lower end of 0.5 uh, to 1.5 percent. Um, and therefore, whether the same rationale exists for the, the restrictions on our lives, the restrictions on our working um, is very is sort of very different. And so should the solutions remain the same? Probably not. Actually, we should be looking at that some more loosening, we should be looking at which restrictions need to stay in place, which sectors need to stay closed. Um, things like singing in very small enclosed spaces is not going to come back anytime soon. Um, and, but things like you know, wide open plan office spaces, a bit more likely that those will happen, that those are feasible. Uh, factories looks like those are much more feasible. And so should you be looking towards removing some of the furlough support and therefore allowing a lot more of the economy to go back and also revealing which companies are no longer profitable um, and therefore allowing much more of the sort of allocative efficiency that you need to have um, an efficient market system work. Um, and so Germany looks like it's extending theirs. France looks like it's extending theirs. But they were a little bit less generous than the UK's was. Um, and we still have quite a relatively generous welfare system underneath um, the furlough with universal credit, which is designed to get people back into work. So then it's a bit more generous than the United States, for example. So I do think that it's right that we relook at it. Um, whether, whether the Chancellor is right to remove it wholesale, um, I'm not sure that he will actually towards the end of October. We've also, we've seen various moves about uh, Robert Jenrick has, for example, carried on uh, bans on evictions. We've got various uh, sort of um, corporate loan schemes that are going to carry on through a period. The Bank of England is carrying on with its loose monetary policy. I suspect that come the budget, we'll be looking at sort of a tapered but not fully removed furlough scheme. Um, and we may even see it just transfer into a, if you're ill or some, if your company needs to close or your local area needs to close, um, then you'll have some form of sick pay that is the furlough. 
Len, you've been skeptical of the scheme from the start. I think it's fair to say um, you've written a lot about the potential um, unintended consequences of such a support scheme. Um, do you think there? Do you buy the idea that it could actually save money um, in the long run by keeping businesses um, afloat, or do you think that that's false? Yeah, I think that's probably false, Emily. Uh, you have to look at the, the detail of this and, and where these jobs are going to be saved or not saved. Uh, I, I think uh, the, to, to extend the scheme now, we send out completely the wrong signal. Uh, we're very slow at getting people back into, into, uh, into work anyway. Uh, if, if, you know, the signal is now, oh, you can relax a bit more and the furlough will extend. I mean, where do you draw the line on this? I can see the arguments still being the same in six months' time. Mm. Um, the longer this goes on, uh, the, the, the less plausible it is that these jobs are going to be coming back. Uh, uh, you know, I've, I've said this in normal times, in a six-month period, probably over a million jobs will disappear. Um, and, and the thing is, of course, that nor in normal conditions, more than a million jobs are created during that period. And if we're, you know, just taking the view that we have to try to uh, maintain uh, the kind of jobs which people have doing, been doing in the past, I think this is, this is foolish. I think also that the, the opportunities for uh, malfeasance of one kind or another, fraud, uh, you know, using this scheme for purposes for which it's not originally intended, I mean, a lot of companies have used it simply to juggle around normal patterns of demand, which rise and fall during the summer and so forth. I think, uh, you know, the longer it goes on, the, the more savvy people are at trying to play, you know, game this system. And that's another reason uh, for, for stopping it. Now, uh, you know, um, Matt is quite right that there are some areas which are going to need some kind of tailored help. And it's difficult to see any time soon Anything which involves performances, theatres, concerts, uh, even professional sport, um, you know, it's going to be a long time before, if, you know, before we get back to, to something like what we used to call normal. And I don't think just extending this, this all-purpose general scheme is really going to be the way forward. Um, we mentioned, uh, you know, um, Matt mentioned in there the, the, the German scheme, or you mentioned the German scheme. That, of course, has always been rather different from ours, the Kurzarbeit scheme, which wasn't specifically introduced for coronavirus. It was something which was used, you know, during the, the, the financial um, uh, crisis of uh, 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, but this was always a scheme based on short, short, short hours working, as its name suggests, Kurzarbeit. And um, this was meant to keep people in touch with their employer. And... Um, you know, people were working part time uh, and having some kind of support. Um, so you were always, you know, these businesses which were paying this were still alive in some sense. They were doing something, whereas the furloughing scheme has not had that until very recently. So uh, just to summarise there, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I am very aware of the problems, the continuing problems of, of many businesses and their employees. But just extending our existing scheme, which was spatchcocked together at the last moment anyway, is not the way forward into 2021, 2022, who knows? Matt, you raised an interesting point there about the fraud. Has the ASI had a look at this? I know it was across the papers maybe last week um, that a huge number of businesses were taking advantage. I mean, it depends on what you mean by taking advantage. I think it was a level of like, at the very beginning, various people didn't know actually whether you were allowed to work or not allowed to work, what counted as work. And there was a very strange, uh, that, but, but I think it became very quickly apparent. There was definitely widespread fraud of people like claiming that they weren't working, but being, but working. And, um, you know, some companies went down to just having night, like, you know, what, there was one company who will remain nameless for this, for this tale, um, who has two and a half thousand employees and they furloughed all but nine people. Oh my goodness! You know, annual reports and investments and so on, and it's sort of like, well, that's not that's that's unlikely, shall we say? And I think, like, just like every other kind of benefit uh, fraud, that that should be heavily clamped down on and that revisited. And directors have pullback mechanisms, and they have um, they have 
you know, penalty clauses and that they should be pursued by both by shareholders and also by um, the authorities. Um, I don't necessarily buy... I think the big question here, which is the big question about the entirety of the pandemic, is are we an optimist about the virus itself or are we pessimistic about um, sort of the ongoing nature of the pandemic? Um, if you are a proper optimist, I think that you think that this pandemic ends within a year. Um, and therefore, via one way or another, whether we find a vaccine and we roll it out en masse, um, or we have much more effective treatments coming into place, um, and therefore that we can go back effectively to normal within 12 months. Um, therefore, like when Len's saying this, you know, I can see the rationale being the same in six months. I can totally see the rationale being the same in six months. Um, however, all of the indications for a whole range of the vaccines suggests that actually that they are working relatively well through trials. Um, and with 148 of them in production, um, I'm optimistic about the strength of, the, of, of human society to defeat this. Um, the pessimistic response is that we have to get used to this. Um, in that respect, then I'm absolutely with Len, and I want to see you know, that, that, that allocative efficiency come back into the market system as soon as possible because that, that is the new normal. The new normal is that we have to get used to it and therefore that the market has to get used to it and therefore, and therefore you shouldn't be spending money that we don't have trying to elevate ourselves above a reality that like, is no longer that, right? So um, you've got to come da back down to earth and if that's with a bump, it's with a bump. But you know, if, we, if we can land this thing, then it makes sense to land it um, rather than crash it into the sea. So in that respect, I still sit there and I go, yes, actually, it does make sense to continue targeted support for airlines and targeted support for even for cruise ships and, and so on, because you still want them to come back. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that like, you know, and I actually sometimes this is where, you know, we could say that we want things to be complex and targeted, but that creates that weird perverse incentive structure that, you know, we usually complain about in tax systems because it's very gameable. Um, and actually these broad blanket responses are the kind of thing that we sit there and say we want in more welfare and more tax um, policy. And it's been relatively, it's been relatively good at dealing with the initial issue, but and again, I'll use the idea of the natural disaster. It's like, yes, okay, fine, you saved everyone with a flood, um, but now the flood waters recede, you go, okay, you guys have some savings in the bank, we're not going to necessarily give you the full whack. Um, you, know, you guys have you know, like chains outside of the state or whatever, so you can, you can rebuild your business, but then if you've got absolutely nothing, not even like clothes on your back, then yeah, actually we will step in as a society and help you out. Um, and that's effectively like where we are with some some of the sort of like bigger cities, bigger businesses, and so on. Mm. But so I don't. Oh, sorry, go on. Like the way in which the government has decided um, that patterns of behaviour which have changed must be forced back into um, into into old ways of doing stuff. So you know, the government wandering around telling people that they must go back into the office or that they must go commute back into the city centres. Well, I'm sorry. I mean, I like going into the office and I like seeing my colleagues and I live in city centre London, so it's not that hard for me to do this. But for people who live out, who've like quite enjoyed having a pub lunch and maybe then going back to their, to their home desk and you know, picking up their kids from school and having a bit more family time, yeah. uh, like they don't want to go back into the office and I can't sit there and say, well, the government must force them with a whip hand. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, just, you know, just like the... You know, Prince of Egypt, I fully expect someone to lead, <laughs> lead, lead them from, to the promised land. Which... Well, I think, you know, I think with um, it will be a sort of peer pressure. I think as more and more people come in, people will get a fear of missing out and then we'll all be back. No one wants to be the only one left at home. So, Len, if there's a vaccine within the next six months, it makes sense to extend. I just don't believe a vaccine is going to turn up like that. And even if it does, there are huge logistic you know, logistical problems of getting uh, 60 odd million people vaccinated. Uh, we know with, with vi you know, vaccines against viruses like this, that they're, they're not 100% effective. Um, there are mutations of the virus, which will, you know, which will, uh, as with flu vaccines, which change every year. Um, so I think, I, I think the, the, the idea that a vaccine is suddenly going to cure all this is, is, is not right. I think what's more likely 
is that if we allow people to to uh, congregate more and so on, eventually the the, the virus will be diluted, will be diluted, will mutate into a uh, a less uh, virulent form. Uh, you know, rather like flu epidemics of the past, the great, you know, the, 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 the uh, 1919 one, for example, uh, the thing will gradually disappear. But there isn't going to be some moment when you can say there is no risk. Everybody is now vaccinated. The thing is defeated. Let's move on to the next thing. So, uh, and I just go back to what Matt was saying. Yeah, I, I think we are going to see major changes in, in the way in which people work and so on. But I don't, I don't really accept the view that, that uh, home working is the answer for, for everybody. Uh, for a start, I don't believe the story that productivity has boomed as a consequence of people working at home. I mean, if you try and get hold of anybody uh, for oh, any yeah. career, whoever <laughs> at the moment, it takes ages to do so. You get passed from one person to another, emails take days to be responded to and so forth. People may feel that they're productive, that they're working hard and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, the system as a whole isn't working well. And I think uh, we are going to have to have a lot more people back at conventional, uh, or, or in conventional offices. Yeah, maybe they'll only be in for three days a week instead of five or whatever it may be. Uh, there will be a new way of working and so on. But I really think we ought to be moving towards that rather than trying to freeze the, uh, the pattern of employment, pretend that jobs are there for people whose jobs have, uh, you know, are disappearing, won't come back. Uh, we've got to be realistic about this. Well, I think that's the thing, right? So, but the, gov the government has a duty to set out what the implications of the policies that they're making. Um, and they can make the argument that they're not going to force people back into offices, that they're not going to change the incentive structures to force you back in, but also that they're going to remove the furlough at the same time. Um, and that get, effectively tells you, and like they should spell out, you know, philosophically why they're doing it. That they are letting the they're letting you and your business come to a new equilibrium of what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes that means jobs will go, and sometimes that means that you'll be able to work three days a week from home. And sometimes for some people, they'll be able to they'll be able to okay, live in the Outer Hebrides rather than in inner city London and so on. But like, that's the entire point. The entire point is that it is the free market system that under, un, underpins that. And if the Tories aren't willing to say and explain the mechanism of why they're doing X, Y, and Z, um, then people will be very confused at the sort of mixed messages of telling people to go back in, but also removing the supports for the businesses in the first place, and then them losing their job and being very angry. Um, they, need to be, they need to explain the coherent and consistent ideology that exists behind them, what they're doing, why they're doing it. Yeah, I agree. There's been lots of mixed messages over the last few months. But just to finish, Len, um, of course, there are businesses that have been disproportionately impacted by lockdown measures and the pandemic, as you said, you know, concert halls, um, sports fixtures, the travel industry. Um, do we risk by not extending the furlough scheme that these businesses that would have otherwise flourished um, all the entrepreneurship, the ingenuity, the hard work that's gone into those businesses, do we not risk losing those? And is that not a waste? Well, there will, there will be waste. Uh, you know, there's, there's no doubt about this. But I think the, the problem is going to be the same if we extend this for three months, for six months, for a year. Uh, we're still going to face it, this problem. And I think the longer it goes on, the more out of sync um, you know, people's expectations are. Um, I think we really do need to, I, I, I mean, as, as Matt says, we need a coherent strategy. We haven't got one at the moment. We've got people talking about higher taxes, uh, you know, uh, about uh, Boris's New Deal, which I'm extremely cynical about. Uh, I mean, the idea that you can spend your way out of this recession, I think, is something which needs knocking on the head. But of course, if you are going to spend like this, you've got to have higher taxes. Uh, this is going to, to, to deter other businesses and so forth. So the, the government really needs to get itself organised and, and with a clear strategy, not try to bend the wind of every opinion poll, every, you, you know, every... Uh, everything that Nicholas Sturgeon does or, or whatever, you know, we ought to, we, we, we really need uh, straight thinking about how we get out of this and there will be problems on the way. But, um, you know, like Matt, I'm ultimately quite optimistic about the economy and the way in which we can reset and, and, and move forward. 
uh, you know, uh, prior to the, the uh, coronavirus, we had a very successful labor market. Jobs were being created all the time in very large numbers. We can get back to those. I think we need other things like deregulation and lots of chunks of the labor market. But that's a different story for another day. Yeah, I mean, we made the argument that the government has to focus on four different things. Um, it, it needs to include their restrictions back in the springtime um, and through the summer meant that there were limits on the number of transactions, there were limits on the investments that were going to be made, there were limits on employment, um, and there were, uh, there were limited access to goods and services. Um, all four of those things, increasing those beyond the trend of the, of the, last, of the last few years, um, have got to be the priority of the government. Now, the numbers look relatively good for the government in this quarter because of pent-up demand, but um, as we've seen in France and Germany, that doesn't necessarily last if you then end up with a second wave. Um, Germany obviously doing the best of all of the major European economies in so many ways um, and for so many reasons. But the, you know, what, as Len says, we've got mixed messages from various being leaked out of government in the first couple of days coming back um, after recess. Um, I'm not so sure that this isn't just game playing. I've been talking to various people behind the scenes on this and they're saying like this is very clearly... Um, one man and his team um, spreading muck effectively over all of the other members of the cabinet uh, and that we shouldn't necessarily pay any heedance to um, the sort of like we're going to raise fuel duty, we're going to raise corporation tax because they're, they're not idiots. They know that the economy has fallen off a cliff and the idea of taxing it or spending their way out isn't going to work. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I think that you know, one chief advisor in particular has a bit of a love for grand plans and grand projets. Um, but again, the treasury is full of its naysayers uh, who will tell him that there is no money and that these don't work and that it's not going to happen. Um, and it will be a battle of wills to some respect. I don't necessarily think that um, he'll get that far. And lots of the money, in fact, when Boris did his build, build, build speech, I think that kind of set the terms for like how much the treasury were going to let him really get away with various things. It was billed as this big FDR. He's going to spend a hundred billion pounds, you know, doing everything that they've always wanted to do. And it, I think he re-announced six billion pounds of spending. Um, so I can fully expect to see lots of spending that was announced, re-announced um, come the autumn time. Uh, that, that, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. If they want to portray it as this big new deal, whilst actually it's not very much, then then that's relatively good. Whilst also removing some of those breaks that they have in the tax and investment system, which means that private businesses, which are the ones who have been restricted for the past six months from making any money, are actually able to get back out there um, and grow the economy. And of course, in a few months' time, we've also got Brexit on the way, so they've got to make sure that the, that the wider market economy and the you know our, our place in the global trading system is is uh, maintained or enhanced. Even um, um, you know we've also got the Europe on the Europe. It's going to be it's going to be a rocky rocky ride. There you go. On that optimistic and uh, exciting note, thank you for joining me, Matt. Thank you for joining me, Len. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Uh, see you next time.